listening and watching Rashkin Report. I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin, and we are joined today by Professor of Economics at Carthage College, Yuri Maltsev, also Yuri. Yuri, welcome to the program. Nice to be with you, Yuri. It's, it's the best we would, name. We wouldn't forget each other's names. Right. That, that is clear. Um, well, we, we have uh, a very polarized nation that we're living in. We have people that uh, are seeing things differently. And, uh, and you're teaching at, at a university. And what kind of misconceptions do you feel your students more, most often have that you feel like you need to kind of set them straight? Well, the most important thing, I think, is that, that they are being taught in high schools and in university that socialism is an alternative to capitalism, that socialism is something acceptable, which it is not. The great Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, he used to say that there is no choice between capitalism and socialism. It's the same thing that the choice between a glass of milk and a glass of solution of potassium cyanide is not the choice between beverages, it's the choice between life and death. The same here. Socialism is not an economic system, it's a simple system of management. It's public slavery, where slaves are doing what their masters want them to do, <coughs> not because they're paid for that, or they have any other incentives, but because they're threatened. They're threatened with violence, with death, and Anywhere from 43 to 61 million of people in the Soviet Union <coughs> were murdered by their so socialist socialist owners. I don't even care whether it's 43 million or 61 million. Both numbers are kind of above my understanding. And Stalin himself, he realized that. He used to say, death of one is a tragedy, death of a million, just statistics. Yuri, let me ask you this then. Do you feel that the problem of uh, dictate, well, not okay, I, I'm kind of giving away the question, but problems that have occurred in Russia and Soviet Union, especially during the 20th century and kind of beyond, do you feel that they're due to the ideology, whether it's socialism or, I don't know, this mutation of capitalism that exists now, or is it due to really strong-handed government, like dictatorship, whether it's dictatorship of Vladimir Putin or dictatorship of Soviet Union and, and commissars and, and all of that, and Stalin? Well, there are two things. One thing is, again, that socialism is public so-called ownership. There is no such thing as public. So it is a government ownership of everything. When the government owns all plants, all factories, all businesses, and yourself, this is what socialism is. And to say that, that there is an ideology or not, yes, they have ideological window dressing, but this is, uh, this is uh, this, the, all these dictatorships, they're inevitable. Because if you nationalize everything, you, you completely destroying pluralism in society. Then everybody should think the same or else. And again, socialism is not an economic system. It's a simple system of management of slaves, public slavery 101. Now, when I think about what you're saying, and I think about my personal experience in which I'm uh, an elected official on a very local level, so I go to committee meetings, and there committee meetings I see that we're going to have a new building and how this building is going to be laid out, where different offices are going to be. Uh, that is actually a decision of the employees because these are county employees and they get to decide where they want, you know, what's the most efficient workflow for them and, and those kinds of things. To me, this is uh, employees taking ownership uh, through government off of their own workplace. That seems like a pretty logical thing to do because we as users of their services should be benefiting from their better workflow, better work efficiency, all of those things. Now, if this was a purely private enterprise, then they would probably just say, you know what, you're going to be sitting over here, you're going to be sitting over here, and that's how it is. Isn't, you know, isn't there some in involvement from people, some form of uh, sharing of responsibility uh, kind of has some better some has good possibilities that's nothing has to do with socialism it's absolutely um, i mean this is just what uh, 
workers' participation in management, which is practiced uh, almost in all companies. And it's good that it's practiced well by the local government in which you're part of. And that's, uh, that's really, uh, there's nothing, nothing special or nothing wrong with that. Because Armen Alkian, a, a great, a great uh, um, American economist, uh, uh, who died recently, his, uh, his point is that every government is a form of socialism because that government building would be owned by government. So it meets Marx's definition what socialism is. However, it's a little island in the ocean of private property. So it doesn't make the weather. It doesn't kill people, your building. Um, and then it's also only good that people do do participate in design and whatnot. They feel they feel uh, important, and they feel and they and they definitely the final result would be. But that's different. not socialism. That's not uh, no, any that sort not. of like that. Okay. Why would that be socialism? Well, because the the this is government, little form of government, a little enterprise within a government. How the services are provided, uh, you know, and it's all being worked together versus a top down management system. Um, of course, you know, I, I don't feel like yeah, Soviet Union was really a good form of socialism either because there was like, a, you know, there's a, a um, bureaucracy, nomenclature, g running things. It's different than uh, either private enterprise or, or government enterprise. It just seems like um, you, you know, <clears throat> I feel like I'm more open minded to socialism, but I'm very suspicious of it. And I feel like you are just totally rejecting it. And and, uh, and and I you know, and there's nothing good about it. But isn't there something good in everything? <laughs> I don't know what was good in Auschwitz. I don't Reg know. Regular meals, I suspect, or some kind of a safety for God knows. You know, let's not. You know, again, this. The, you know, I don't the, know about safety in Auschwitz. No, um, I think that there's. You know, it's it doesn't have to go to concentration camp. And you know well, that's what it is. Yeah, well, that's what socialism is. That depends on the. That's also the matter of degree. In United States government, um, through government, about one fourth of gross domestic product goes through. In countries like France, for example, it's about fifty percent. Fifty percent. Is that a socialist? It's more socialist country, but it's not socialist as well because other fifty percent is good. Is 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 private property. So it's a matter of degree. And Soviet Union was a hundred percent. There was no private property. It was personal property. You could have, you could own your your toothpaste and your toothbrush, and things like that. But you couldn't own anything else. You even lived in the government houses, and um, and definitely everything belonged to the. And today, a lot of students, unfortunately, are being caught into this, into this ideology that. Why they, do you think it is so appealing to them, though? Because they don't know what it is. They think that socialism is kind of like smoking pot and singing kumbaya. That's what the they idea of socialism is. Churchill, uh, he had this wonderful quip. He had I mean, several millions of them. But, but his quip was that if you are 20 years old and you are not a socialist, you do not have a heart. But if you are 30 and still a socialist, you do not have a brain. And that's exactly what it is because young people they're very compassionate they don't then they never heard about stalin's gulags about national socialism of hitler which is another form of socialism um and so that's why they kind of they being caught on this on but this could it be that actually the reality is is that uh the interest in socialism is due to the fact that our current system in its current form is not addressing concerns of more and more people and therefore young and old are looking at something else and the only something else that we have seems to be socialism right now i would think that's not that it's not true that these concerns were cultivated by our educational system that educational system <laughs> okay went, it went amok and we have we have a pretty socialist, socialist-oriented system of secondary education and higher education. Uh, I think that conservatives they lost already cultural wars 
because if you will look, Hollywood uh, hates capitalism with passion. If you will look at, at the schools, at the higher education institutions, uh, how many conservatives or libertarians or just non-socialists are there? Very few. But isn't it just connected to education level? Like most Trump supporters, as we had this conversation online, but we can we can talk about this for a couple of minutes. The 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 lower education level of Trump supporters that you were arguing with this, but it seems to me you're one of the very few highly educated people uh, that supports Trump that I know of. Another wrong statement, because uh, there were recently uh, very interesting studies. If you will just Google that, who are Trump supporters? you will see that Trump supporters on the average are more educated than supporters of Democrats. That Trump supporters, that this myth that it is blue collar, uh, kind of racist, uh, um, rough rednecks uh, who support, that, that's invention of, of Mrs. See, Clinton. See, I think that you can, you and I can call the same people uh, different words that, you know, like not, not necessarily racist, but you can say that somebody who is disadvantaged and didn't have the opportunities or didn't travel or, I mean, there's, you know, it seems like you're describing the same people much more ins insultingly and in, in, uh, disrespectfully than I actually do. But no, this, this you know, people, what I'm saying is that the educational level is the same. On the many, it doesn't make many somebody a bad person. It just makes them less educated. Well, less educated or that's a personal choice, how to right. be educated. If you will look, the richest people in the United States are uneducated. Look at Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and the likes. Joe, Jeff See, Bezos. So, so not but, being educated, that doesn't well, mean they're Warren bad Warren or it doesn't mean they're Trump. unsuccessful. But usually if they have a lower education level, they support Trump. Um, or if they support Trump, they have lower education level. That's not. But this you know. is again, this is a stereotype of New York Times or Washington Compost. This is what it is. That the that. Um, you uh, think that if we take the general Democratic voter average mm -hmm. versus Republican voter average, the Democratic mm -hmm. voter average is going to have higher education level or about the same? No, no. It's about the same, but in many states. Trump voters would have higher education. Just Google it. It's very, very simple. Okay. Uh, because if you, if you will read Washington, or listen to Mrs. Clinton, uh, deplorables from the basket of deplorables or whatever is unredeemable, this is how she was dealing no, with... No, and I think that's just a, it's a, it's a way to kind of demonize the, the conversation because I think that there's a lot of people who are not benefiting from the system. And, and they're looking for solutions, and sometimes solution to them is to vote for Bernie Sanders, and sometimes to them solution is to vote for Donald Trump. And who is not benefiting from the system? I think a lot of the people that actually are in that basket of deplorables, frankly. And what? why would they support Trump so much if they... If they the low uh, education level, exactly. No, because, because he is... Try, uh, trying to better, to enhance the system, uh, not to destroy the system. No, he's mostly well, trying to ruin it for others, which I think makes his supporters feel better. No, come on. Why would that be? It, it just seems like when we are doing less, when we're not helping others, you know, it goes into like, why help others when we should be helping ourselves and then we don't help ourselves. So we're just not helping anybody. And I guess that makes his supporters happy because there's less help. <laughs> You, you just made, uh, produced a couple of sentences. In whose mouth you would like to put them in? Have you ever heard Trump saying something like that? I, I don't him. think he'd be this nice. No, he never said anything like this. No, I mean, just if you will. No, I think Trump makes like fun of people. Uh, Trump makes erroneous statements. Trump says, presents reality as he wants to see it. But, you know, you're, you're an academic, so you don't have that kind of a problem. Yes, yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm uh, reading because I'm interested in, in, in social issues and I'm working with younger people. I am even reading his tweets. And some of his tweets are really kind of, I would say, rather vulgar, unpleasant. Some of them are very funny. Uh, I like that about uh, John Bolton. 
So I would listen to him. He would start World <laughs> War Six, I think. Yeah. yeah maybe it was. That was funny. You're right. Or another one is about Kim Jong Un. Uh, Kim Jong Un calls me old. I don't call him fat or stupid because I want to be his friend. That's pretty funny for the president to say. Uh, but, but putting this aside, what is great about it? Great about it is um, this this period that incentives return back to our economy. Uncertainty turned into certainty. That's why we have this booming stock market. That's why people are investing into our economy. That's why unemployment is 55 years low. Um, that's why the, the people at the bottom again of the labor market uh, have the highest increases in their income. So if you will look at all this, then then I can I can forgive the person uh, maybe some um, some uh, uh, tasteless uh, uh, tweets or or. Or, or yeah, but you're you're an economist. You see what that means. You you can see behind those numbers, so to say. That mm -hmm. you see that it's not just the number of jobs that is growing, but like number of jobs that any person is working is growing. Is that people have to work more, and then their money doesn't go as far, and ultimately they feel disadvantaged and left behind, and so they vote for the more extreme candidate, whether it be on the right or the left. Isn't that seem just kind of reasonable? It doesn't, because I cannot say that Trump is on the right. I can say that Bernie Sanders is on the left. Where is Trump then? Is he like off the right? No, he is, I would say, center right. He is center right. He is not extreme right. For what reason he would be? Because he still is, I mean, he's still presiding over this huge national debt. He's presiding over this huge government spending. And he is presiding. He is the good thing about Trump, definitely, that he is pulling out troops from all over the world. Where stretched there, he kind of is isolationist more in in foreign policy. I, his foreign policy, from my perspective, is impeccable, because if you will look what what he did, he defeated ISIS. Uh, he is pulling our troops from the harm's way. Uh, he is not. If if we would have. Mrs. Clinton, I think we would already be uh, destroying Syria to the to the to the absolute zero uh, zone, and on and on like that. So this is um, this this this, and it's a matter of choices, definitely. But I don't see also what are the reasons for this class war that all the Democrats are promoting. It's this class war. If you will look, our poor people. If you will put. 11% of the poorest Americans, they will still have incomes higher than most European countries. And most, if that would be a separate country, it would be in the upper 20% of Europe, of Europe. So we have a class struggle between, say, Toyota owners who are dying of envy towards Lexus owners. This, is, this kind of class war is, uh, is laughable. Well, all right, uh, Yuri, then I will, I guess, uh, to, to uh, address your point, I will say that, of course, it's, again, extremes, you know, yes, it is better here than it is in North Korea, it is better here than it is in most other places, and at the same time, we also are falling behind on other charts, and, and, uh, and it's, it's a kind of a fluid situation, and ultimately, we're not moving in the right direction right now, but what I'm more concerned about, you brought in the, the foreign policy for, and, I, and I'd like to, you know, I think it would be unfair to end our conversation without addressing it at least somewhat because Yuri and Yuri were both from Russia. We, you know, I think we're both very glad not to be there. And uh, my question is, do you think that Trump and Putin relationship, what do you think of it? And do you think it is in the best interest of the United States? Trump-Putin relationship? Yes. And what is that? The Trump, that well... Trump? Trump uh, say it again. On the way home, more Russian diplomats than ever in the history of this country. So you're of the opinion that we're that Trump is harsh on Putin. Very harsh on Putin. And when you were saying that Putin is to tell you the truth, still Putin, as much as I don't like him, and uh, I my last article published in Russian 
or have the self-descriptive titles meat voted for a meat grinder and uh, yeah because mr putin is a proud member of the kgb um yeah, i uh, think communist party still no repentance no nothing however because there's more private initiative right now less government property now russians are living much 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 better than before uh, before the collapse but don't you feel though that the kind of freedom you're advocating is the kind of freedom that you would like push somebody out of an airplane without a parachute and be like you're free because what russia is moving to is, is very much that level of capitalism which is kind of like soviet union without the social safety net because uh they keep cutting their social expenses and they're just kind of decided that they don't need to really be responsible for people so it is kind of that I guess more, you know, uh, freedom, economic freedom, except that it doesn't seem to work for many people when it's, you know, freedom ends up being giving a lot of advantages to those with most, which are whether it's oligarchs or just people with money have much better advantages in that kind of, a, uh, you know, bullfighting, uh, everyone's for themselves kind of freedom that I think you're promoting. No, I'm not promoting that. And you know that for sure, that, that this is a, uh, no, in the in Russia they don't have economic freedom, but they have more economic freedom. That's what I'm saying. Than they used to in Soviet Union. More economic freedom, and they already live much better. Right. Their life expectancy increased by 10 years. Last year alone, 12 million Russians went overseas for vacations or tourism. So 12 million. When I defected from the Soviet Union, it was 70,000 per year Soviet citizens would go and that was mostly would be kgb officers so now we have 12 million people uh, you have car ownership phone ownership everything else because uh, you wouldn't believe it because i was in social i worked for the state committee on labor and social affairs over there uh, for a while so i looked through all the social statistics uh, at that time they had 16 16 telephones per 100 households. Can you imagine? The, those are North Korean standards. 0 0.4 cars per 100 households. Besides that, they were manipulating statistics. They would put KGB cars as well, or police cars. Or right, but then, but there would you say that it's this is credit goes to Putin or credit goes to the fact that the Soviet Union is no longer there? Yes, that's that. there, there is no, no full-blown socialism there. Uh, I think credit goes to certain people, Mr. Gorbachev, who removed fear out of the system, which was glued together only by fear. So the system collapsed like a card house. Um, I would credit, I wrote a, several articles about him. Alexander Yakovlev, who was secretary of the Communist Party, uh, was the Central Committee of the Communist Party, who really knew what he was doing unlike mr gorbachev and um, he uh, his point was uh, that when he was asked uh, what means restructuring perestroika perestroika right. and what does he want to this to, to restructure his point was i want to this i want to restructure this evil state into a pile of rubble so he knew what he was doing mr gorbachev no he was all the time saying we should enhance social we can we should make it we should make it um, acceptable by a majority of people it should be social with a human face I can tell you a, a funny joke I remember from from Soviet times and the joke was that that um, James Bond he retired from Her Majesty's Secret Service and was immediately drafted as a CIA consultant and they sent him to Moscow to find out what's going on there when under Gorbachev. And he is walking from one store to another. He walks to the bakery. He's writing in a little notebook, no bread. Goes to the butcher shop, right there, no meat. And there is a KGB officer looking over his shoulder. And he said, a year ago, you would be shot for doing that. He writes there, no bullets. And that's exactly when people realize there's no bullets. Then everybody stopped working. I remember that very well because I'm labor economist. And then people stopped working and the whole thing imploded. I remember this absolutely empty shelves everywhere. And that's the, and that, that was the end of it. 
So who should be credited? Soviet people definitely should be credited. Then even people in KGB or whatever else, party, nobody defended that. If you remember, it was completely bloodless, bloodless revolution. Who should be also credited? Well, Mr. Gorbachev, he, I think, inadvertently. Uh, I listened to him several times in different meetings, and, and sometimes, uh, once he said, many economists think that central planning does not work. It does. The problem is that we never had a good plan. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting next to another economist. I don't want to mention his name. He he kind of um, uh, he kind of bent to me and he said, "Do you think there is anything behind this birthmark?" And I, <laughs> and it doesn't look like there is. And uh, and that was the end of the USSR. Then people like Yeltsin and others they contributed a little bit. Uh, but the problem is that, say, with Yeltsin uh, and Putin today, the problem is that they discredit capitalism because people think they live under capitalism and democracy. And they think democracy is a war in Chechnya. They think capitalism is the fact that oligarchs have everything. And, no, and oligarchs right now are also being harassed by Mr. Putin. Yuri, yeah. I, you know, I, I hate to interrupt you, but we need to wrap this up for today. But this is just so interesting because it seems like Russia is discrediting whatever ideology they're pursuing at the time. They're giving it a bad name, whether it's the socialism or capitalism. Thank you so much for your conversation. Yuri Maltsev, professor of labor economics at Carthage College. Uh, thank you for being on the program. You've been watching Rashkin Report. This was Yuri Rashkin. Yeah, it was a pleasure, Yuri. Yes, so we have uh, two Yuris, two worldviews. Yes. That's right.